a central Paris railway station at the height of the rush hour. Thousands of passengers head for home. Suddenly, a runaway train hurtles towards the station. Three hundred and seven tons of crashing metal slam into a packed commuter train. Fifty-six people die. It's Paris's worst ever train crash. Now, using advanced computer simulations, we reveal exactly what led to tragedy at the Gare de Lyon. Disasters don't just happen, they're a chain of critical events. Unravel the clues and count down those final seconds from disaster. Europe. France. Paris. June 27th, 1988. A summer's evening in the French capital. Paris is the focal point of the French rail network. The French are proud of their rail system. It's one of the biggest in Europe, with over 34,000 kilometers of track. With state funding and an ongoing modernization program since the early 80s, the system is increasingly high-tech and efficient. 6.20 p.m. The 5.38 inbound commuter service from Melun to Paris Gare de Lyon station is running on time. It's a 40-kilometer journey, which takes 50 minutes. It's an eight-carriage train. And in the driver's cab is 42-year-old Daniel Solin. He's worked for SNCF, the French National Railway, since he was 15. Jean Beauvais is the guard on the train. He's another old hand who also joined the SNCF straight from school. So far, it's been a routine trip. But at 6.36 p.m., eight kilometers outside Paris, as the train passes through Verde Maison station, something unexpected happens. A young woman in the second carriage leaps up and pulls the emergency cord. A bell in Solan's cab tells him someone has pulled the cord, automatically activating the brakes. The woman slips from the train and disappears. Before the train can set off again, Solan needs to reset the alarm and rearm the brakes. It's an all too familiar procedure. It should only take a few minutes, but nevertheless, Solan radios the control room to alert them to the holdup. 6.40 p.m. Most of the passengers, fearing a long delay, leave the train to find another way to complete their journey. The remaining few resign themselves to a late arrival in Paris. Solan and Beauvais set about rearming the brake system so the train can continue its journey to Gare de Lyon station. Gare de Lyon is the Paris rail station serving the south and east of the country. Behind its magnificent 19th century exterior lies one of Europe's most sophisticated rail hubs. It's one of France's busiest railway stations. With a mixture of intercity service and commuter trains serving the suburbs. The nerve center coordinating all train movements is the station's control room. Duty manager tonight is Andre Tolence. He's in charge of safety and ensuring that the 360 trains into and out of the station run as smoothly as possible. Always at the back of his mind is the threat of terrorism. For the past seven years, Arab militant groups have been targeting Paris. They're protesting about French troops in war-torn Lebanon and demanding the release of Arab prisoners. Many of the attacks have been on trains in and out of the city. 6.45 p.m. Hurrying towards Gare de Lyon station to catch a train home is commercial assistant Colette Pacalet. She was late leaving the office and worries she'll miss her train. 
Colette is a recently divorced single mother, and she's anxious to get back to her son, 13-year-old Nicholas. When I finish work, I automatically hurry back to take care of my son. I fix him something to eat and help him with his homework. Forty-year-old Dominique Pavi, who works at the Louvre Art Gallery, is also rushing to catch the same train. Like thousands of others, she's still grappling with the new summer timetable. With new train times and altered routes, it's a recipe for confusion and missed trains. 7.02 p.m. Solin has now fixed the brakes and the train is ready to depart for Paris. But it's taken him much longer than expected. The train is now 26 minutes behind schedule. Controller Tolence instructs Solan to skip the next scheduled stop, Maison Alfort, and travel non-stop to Gare de Lyon to make up time. But Solan's late train isn't Tolence's only headache. 7.04. There's now a problem on one of the commuter trains due to leave Gare de Lyon. It's the train that Colette and Dominique are rushing to catch. Commuter trains have a driver and a guard. Driver Andre Tongi is ready to go, but the guard is running late. Without him, the train can't leave. It's good news for single mother Colette Pakale. She was worried that she would miss her train, so she's relieved it hasn't left. She even manages to secure her usual seat in the front carriage. The delay means more people pile onto the train. Another late arrival is Dominique Pavi. The train was packed. It was hot because it was summer. And being underground, it was hot and sticky. All the passengers and their driver Tongi can do is sit and wait for the guard to arrive. Their outbound train is on platform two, the same platform that the late-running inbound service from Melun is due to use. But they needn't worry. Signalers have pre-programmed a set of points to prevent Solan's train from going into platform two. 500 meters before it reaches the station, the points will automatically switch, sending the train into empty platform one instead. 7.07 p.m. Solan's inbound train is now traveling at over 95 kilometers per hour. A yellow signal warns him he should start to slow down. Just ahead is a steep gradient leading into Gare de Lyon station. He applies the brakes, but there is barely any response. To his horror, Solan realizes that his brakes aren't working. He can't slow his train down. The 300-ton train is hurtling out of control. It's less than two and a half kilometers to the packed rush hour station. A runaway train with defective brakes races towards Paris's Gare de Lyon. It's rush hour, and the station is packed with commuters, including those waiting on a delayed outbound train. Daniel Solan, the driver, is getting desperate. He knows there should be a handbrake somewhere on the train. Guard Jean Bove hurries to look for it. We asked ourselves what was happening to us. We tried the brakes, but there was no response. So I decided to go down the train to look for handbrakes. Solan keeps trying the brakes. It slows the train, but only a little. 7.07 p.m. and 30 seconds. Solar radios a desperate warning to the control room. Stop everything, I've got no brakes. Stop everything, I've got no brakes. Panicking, Solan hits the train's radio alarm signal. It can't be heard by passengers who are still unaware of the danger. But it activates a high-pitched audio alarm in the Gare de Lyon control room and the driver's cabs of all the commuter trains within the vicinity. Immediately, signalmen turn every green light to red. 
drivers stop their trains wherever they are. Within seconds, the entire network grinds to a halt, apart from one train. Unable to do more from his cab, Solan hurries the remaining passengers to the rear of the train. At Gare de Lyon, the guard on the delayed outbound train has finally turned up. But now driver Andre Tanguy's signal switches to red. He has no idea what's going on, and the high-pitched whistle on his radio means he can't use it to find out. Seven oh eight p.m. The runaway train hits the beginning of the steep four-degree gradient that leads into the station. It picks up speed on the sharp descent. Driver Sola manages to get all the passengers into the last carriage. They brace themselves for the inevitable impact. Panic. There was a lot of panic. panic. Train guard Bovey is still desperately searching for a handbrake. I asked myself what was going to happen to me. Was this going to be my last moment? Seven oh eight and fifteen seconds. At Gardelion station, Andre Tanguy is still not sure why he's stuck on a red light. In the second carriage. Passenger Dominique Pavi has had enough of the wait. It was difficult to get off the train, as there were so many people. Excuse me, excuse me. Dominique has to squeeze past other passengers to get to the exit. 7.08 and 30 seconds. Signal operators catch sight of the runaway train rushing past them. Instead of being routed to empty platform one as planned, it's heading straight for Tongi's packed commuter train. The signalmen immediately issue a warning over the station's public address system to evacuate the train. Attention, attention. Andre Tongi hears it. He shouts over the train's intercom to evacuate the train fast. Passengers scramble to reach the doors. 7.08 and 45 seconds. Tongi sees the runaway train heading straight for him. But he knows his train must still be packed with people trying to get off. Instead of jumping clear, he bravely stays on the intercom, repeating his warning to passengers. Seconds later, 307 tons of runaway train smash into the commuter train on platform two. Dominique Pavi leaves the train just in time. She feels the impact of the massive collision just meters behind her. There was a great black dust cloud, a horrific black cloud that was suspended around the train. I could hardly see anything. The dust fell pretty quickly, and it was then that I realized that one train had run into another. And the train that came down from the tunnel had split the first carriage of my train completely in two. On the runaway train, all the passengers have made their way to the rear. Most escape without serious injury. At the moment of impact, I was walking into the last carriage. I heard a great noise and felt a small shock. I didn't even fall over. I just grabbed a railing. But those still on Tongi's stationary train do not fare so well. Tongi doesn't stand a chance. The impact kills him instantly. Single mother Colette Pacolet is in the front carriage, which takes the full impact of the crash. First, I thought it could be a bomb. I don't remember how long it lasted. 10 seconds, 20 seconds. I had no idea of time. I had just enough time to think, oh, I'm going to die. 
Papa, help me. Just seconds ago, Colette was looking forward to spending the evening with her young son. Now she lies trapped in the wreckage with dozens of other severely injured passengers. If she doesn't receive medical attention soon, she may not survive. A runaway train crashes into a packed commuter train at Paris's Gare de Lyon. A photojournalist captures the full horror of the collision just seconds later. A scene of total devastation confronts André Bové, the guard on the runaway train. I still see images, a kind of burning smell, and then people crushed in the carriage. I can still see all that, and just after the impact, the start of the groans. I just wanted to run away. Seven twenty p.m. Eleven minutes after the disaster, the first rescue workers arrive at the Gare de Lyon. Dr. Rooney Yankovitsi, a war-hardened surgeon who saw brutal fighting in the civil war in Chad, has never seen anything like it. It was like a tin of sardines that had been opened. It was totally horrific. There were bodies falling out of windows which were all cut up. You could see decapitated people, amputated people. It wasn't like surgery in wartime. It was worse than surgery in wartime. The scale of the disaster quickly becomes apparent. Rescue workers estimate there are over 100 people trapped in the crushed and twisted train. Khaled Pakalay is one of them. The young mother is pinned between two seats in the first carriage. I don't realize that I'm crushed under the metal or that a train has crashed into us. All that I'm thinking is that I want to get off the train. 7.30 p.m. Many of the passengers have suffered serious crush injuries in the collision. They must act fast. But there's a problem. The crumpled metal of the train prevents rescuers from reaching many of the survivors. Finally, the rescue team is able to free Colette from the metal seats trapping her. 11 p.m. Colette is one of the lucky ones. Dozens of others are still trapped under tons of wreckage. Medics know that many will die from loss of blood and shock if they can't be rescued soon. Dr. Yankovitsi and his team have to make a grim decision. He realizes the only way of freeing the most seriously injured in time is to amputate their trapped limbs. Once on the platform, the full extent of Colette's injuries becomes apparent. Her hip and pelvis are fractured, and she's now lost a dangerous amount of blood. Doctors fear she may not make it through the night. The mayor of Paris, Jacques Chirac, and the minister of transport visit the scene of the crash. The rail operator SNCF is a state-owned company. They want answers, and they want them quickly. 12 noon. Now the weary emergency teams are recovering only bodies. The mangled trains are finally torn apart and the runaway is pulled away for analysis by the accident investigation teams. 56 people are dead and 57 are injured. In hospital, Colette's heart stops beating, but doctors manage to resuscitate her. It's three months before she's well enough to go home to her son. Parisians grieve for the people killed in the Gare de Lyon train crash. It's the worst rail disaster in the French capital's history. But there is anger too. France has one of Europe's most sophisticated rail networks. There are many safety procedures in place to prevent an accident like this. How did such a major disaster strike here? The runaway train was a Z5-300. 
There are up to 140 trains of the same design in use on rail routes into Paris. Since the brakes on Solens train appear to have failed, could other trains of this type also harbor a hidden fatal flaw? The next day, the French government appoints a six-man team to conduct a state investigation. Now, by rewinding events and going deep into that investigation, we can reveal what really happened at the Gare de Lyon. Why did the train's brakes fail? Why did no one reroute the train to safety? And why did many passengers on Platform 2 find out too late that a runaway train was heading straight for them? Advanced computer simulation will take us where no camera can go, into the heart of the disaster zone. Investigators move the wrecked runaway train to a siding. Three days later, they begin an inch-by-inch inch examination of the shattered hulk to find out what went wrong with its braking system. Jean-Pierre Pascal is the investigation team's chief technical advisor. He's head of the National Research Laboratory of Transport and an expert on rail braking systems. Pascal is shocked by the scale of the disaster. This accident at the Gare de Lyon is important because of the number of victims and the scale of the catastrophe. It was exceptional. It wasn't something that I could have even contemplated. I had never seen anything like it. Pascal knows that over the past seven years, terrorists have been bombing French trains. Are militants now using a deadly new tactic to cause carnage on the French rail network? Until investigators find out, thousands of innocent travelers must live in constant fear of attack. Jean-Pierre Pascal is investigating what caused a runaway train to crash at the Gare de Lyon, killing 56 people. His first job is to examine the crashed train. He knows the brakes failed and needs to understand why. As he sifts through the wreckage, he immediately finds something suspicious. It appears a crucial brake valve has been closed. The valve that feeds air down through the train to work the brakes was closed. It should have been open. It's a disturbing discovery. Did someone interfere with the brakes on the runaway train? Investigators must consider a shocking possibility that the runaway train was the victim of a deliberate act of sabotage. The brakes are powered by compressed air generated in the engine carriage. The air is forced down a pipe which runs the entire length of the eight carriage train. Each carriage has an individual brake unit which gets air from this pipe. There's a valve on the pipe at the rear of the engine carriage. On the runaway train, the lever controlling this brake valve is shut, preventing air traveling through the train to power the brakes. The investigators believe there's only one possible conclusion. Somebody must have closed the valve. Pascal realizes that whoever did this must have had specialist knowledge of the train's braking system. So he does not believe it bears the hallmarks of a terrorist attack. Yet it is clear that the valve has been shut. So who closed it? He questions the train's driver, Daniel Sola, and guard Jean Bove to see if they can shed any light on the mystery. Sola tells him the brakes were working fine for the first 58 minutes of the journey. They even bring the train to a quick stop when someone pulls the emergency alarm at Verde Maison. 33 minutes to disaster. The valve must have been closed after this event. Could the person who pulled the emergency cord be involved? Nobody can explain why she pulled the cord, and she was gone before the guard could question her. 
the media puts out an appeal to find who pulled the emergency cord. The day after the crash, Odile Miroir, a 21-year-old single mother, comes forward. Miroir explains that she normally takes this train to Verde Maison to pick up her children from school. She doesn't know that the new summer timetable means the train no longer stops there. Panicking about not being at school in time, she pulls the emergency cord. It automatically activates the brakes throughout the train. Investigator Jean-Pierre Pascal concludes that her actions are irresponsible, but not suspicious. Now Pascal probes the guard, Beauvais, about what happened after the train was abruptly halted at Verde Maison. Guard Beauvais tells him that he goes to reset the emergency cord handle, but the handle is stuck. He can't shift it. The reset handle for the emergency brakes is between the first and second carriage. At the time, you had to go between two carriages. There was a small handle. It wasn't easy. The handle is also very close to the crucial brake valve lever that Pascal discovered had been moved. But neither man recalls anything untoward about the lever. The train driver Solan now has a go, but it's stuck fast. I didn't see exactly what he was doing. We were in a very small space. There were maybe 20 inches between the carriages. After several minutes of sweating, Solan finally shifts the handle, returning the brakes to normal. But when he returns to his cab, he discovers the brakes are still locked. Pascal is puzzled. Why didn't the standard resetting procedure unlock the brakes? He scrutinizes the layout of the braking system on the runaway train and discovers something intriguing. If the brake pipe lever is turned to the off position, a safety mechanism kicks in, keeping the brakes locked, even after resetting the emergency cord. It's a fail-safe system to stop a train from going anywhere without pressurized brakes. Pascal had thought someone closed the valve, perhaps in an act of sabotage. Now, he suspects there may be another explanation. Could Solan have closed it by mistake? He examines his interview with Solan more closely. When we interviewed him, when we asked him questions, he admitted it. He said, I touched that lever to help myself get a good grip. He did it to try and free the handle he thought was stuck. It confirms Pascal's hunch. While trying to reset the emergency cord handle, Solin uses the main brake pipe lever to get more purchase. As he struggles with the emergency cord handle, he inadvertently moves the brake pipe lever, accidentally closing it. Solan thinks he simply reset the emergency cord handle. But by closing the brake pipe valve, he's cut off the air supply from the engine that feeds the brakes throughout the train. The brakes in the last seven carriages are now locked to the on position. But this gives Pascal another puzzle. If the brakes are left on, how does Solan get the train moving again? The only ways to release the locked brakes are by repressurizing the whole system or by manually unlocking each brake individually. Standard procedure dictates that Solan should call out the engineers, who probably would have detected his terrible mistake. But anxious to get going, Solan ignores the rules and tries to unlock the brakes himself. But crucially, he doesn't realize that he's moved the brake lever and that the system is locked due to lack of pressure. Instead, he's convinced the brakes are locked because of another common problem. He said to himself, I'm faced by a situation well known to railwaymen, which is a case of too much pressure. Solan believes there's an airlock in the brake system. This can sometimes happen when the emergency cord is pulled, causing too much pressure around the individual brakes. He thinks that if he can bleed some of it out, the airlock will dissipate and the brakes will unlock. 
Solin works his way along all seven carriages, assisted by Beauvais. Mr. Solan purged the brakes until I said it was fine. I'm not really a technician, but I assisted his actions. It works. The brakes are freed. But Solan's actions are catastrophically misjudged. He has not cleared an airlock and reset the brakes to normal. Instead, he has bled away what precious little air there was left in the system. He's freed the brakes, but also inadvertently overridden one of the fail-safe systems. And with the main brake pipe valve closed, there's no way for new air to come in and replenish the system. With no air left in the system, the train has barely any brakes. Pascal and the team have uncovered a horrifying catalogue of human error. Solin not only disabled the main system for feeding air into the brakes, he then went on to painstakingly disarm the brakes on every passenger carriage. Solan is totally unaware of what he's done. He tells Pascal the brake system pressure gauge in his cab shows the correct reading. He takes it to mean all his brakes are working. In fact, when Solan closed the main brake valve, he isolated the driver's carriage from the rest of the train. The gauge is actually only showing the pressure in the first carriage. 7.02 p.m. Solan finally sets off again for Paris's Gare de Lyon. He's anxious to make up time and quickly reaches over 100 kilometers per hour. Now a 300-ton train with one-eighth of the braking power it needs is heading for Gare de Lyon. But even now, there is still a chance to stop the train. According to the new summer timetable, there's one more scheduled stop at Maison Alfort, six and a half kilometers from Gare de Lyon station. Maison Alfort is on level ground. Had Solin tried his brakes here, then he would have had plenty of time to come to a natural stop, a full four kilometers before reaching Paris. Pascal needs to find out why Solan didn't discover his brakes weren't working at Maison Alfort. He questions Andre Tolence, the duty controller at Gare de Lyon that night. The train is now running 26 minutes late and may throw other trains in the busy timetable off schedule. To make up lost time, Tolence orders Solan not to stop at Maison Alfort and to continue direct to Gare de Lyon. Six minutes from disaster. Solan drives straight through the station. The last chance to use his brakes before the hill down into Gare de Lyon is lost. Yet Pascal knows there are still two safety procedures in place to avert catastrophe. The train has a backup electric powered brake. And at Gare de Lyon, station staff could have used the points to divert the runaway to an empty stretch of track. So why did they both fail? He turns to the last leg of the runaway train's journey to explore Solan's actions after he discovers his brakes are faulty. Two minutes from disaster. A yellow signal indicates to Solan to start slowing down. His train is just over one and a half kilometers from Gare de Lyon. Pascal analyzes the onboard tachograph, which records the train's speed. It confirms that even with just one working brake, Solan does manage to slow the train down from 96 to just 45 kilometers per hour. But then he hits the 4 degree incline heading down to the station and picks up speed again. Even now, Solan still has one last chance to slow down the runaway train. The investigators know that his train has an auxiliary electric-powered brake system. It's designed to slow trains going at high speed to save wear on the brake pads. They're puzzled. Why doesn't he use it? Solan reveals that Bobe did go in search of a handbrake in one of the carriages. But Pascal knows that even if he had found it, it would have been useless. 
but the handbrake is only designed to stabilize a stationary train and is simply not powerful enough to stop a train at high speed. Yet the auxiliary brakes, which could have effectively slowed the train, are operated from the driver's cab, right under Solan's nose. Why didn't Solan use them? Pascal discovers a loathing of the electric brake among drivers. They avoid using this brake because it can cause problems. The combination of air power and electric brakes can often cause jams, locking the wheels. In general, drivers don't use it. Solan was unaccustomed to using the electric brake, and in his panic, he simply forgot it was there. Pascal calculates that if Solan had applied the electric brake in combination with the sole working air brake in the driver's carriage, he could have slowed the train enough to avoid a major collision. According to the calculations we made at the time, the impact would have been only slight. The train would have virtually stopped. But he didn't think of it. Solan's terrible oversight means he loses his last chance to halt the runaway train. But one safety system still remains at the station. Pascal turns to the actions of the station staff. Standard procedure when faced with a runaway train is to identify it and divert it safely to an empty stretch of track. So why didn't this happen? One and a half minutes from collision. Controller Tolence tells Pascal that he hears Solan's distress call over the radio. Gare de Lyon, I've got no brakes. Gare de Lyon, I've got no brakes. In any communication with the controller, the driver should give his name and position. Stop everything, I've got no brakes, stop everything. But in his panic, Solan makes a terrible mistake. He doesn't identify himself. Tolance has no idea which train the distress call came from, and Solan's voice is so distorted with emotion, Tolance doesn't recognize him. And if he can't identify the train, he can't divert it. The controller tells investigators that when he tries to raise the mystery driver again, there's no response. Solan must have left his cab. They realize that this episode leaves Tolance with a terrible predicament. All the controller knows is that the runaway train must be one of four trains bound for the underground platforms. Investigators learn that now Tolance and his staff try to call all four drivers. If they can eliminate the three that are not in trouble, they'll be able to identify the runaway train and divert it to an empty stretch of track. But there's a problem. Before Solan left his cab, he hit the general alarm. It sent a high-pitched whistle through all trains on the network, telling drivers to pull up till they receive instructions. But it also means that drivers start to call Tolance to find out what's going on. Tolance explains that this barrage of calls prevents him from identifying the runaway in time to divert it. But investigators are about to discover that even at this stage, disaster was still not inevitable. On reaching the station, Solan's train was supposed to be routed into platform one, an empty platform. So how did it end up plowing into a packed commuter train? French investigator Jean-Pierre Pascal has discovered that the station staff couldn't divert the runaway train away from the packed commuter train because the driver failed to identify himself. But when Pascal explores the final moments before the collision, he makes a startling discovery. Pascal learns that Gare de Lyon's train routing technology allows signalers to program the points in advance. He finds that the inbound train's route into the station should have been pre-programmed earlier that day, before the crisis. The runaway train was on track 2S, heading for the commuter train on platform 2. But 500 meters before the station, a set of points on the track was supposed to automatically switch Solan's train offline 2S and into platform 1, which was empty. The runaway train would still have hit the buffers at the end of the track, but Pascal is convinced the crash would have been far less devastating. 
In my opinion, no one would have been hurt. The train would have been wrecked, but there would have been no injuries. Did the signalers forget to program the points? Pascal checks and finds there was no oversight. The signalers did their job correctly. So what went wrong? Pascal probes the final moments leading up to the fatal collision. He discovers that when signalers hear the general alarm, the regulations demand that they initiate what's called the general closure procedure. It's a drastic measure. All signals now turn red, stopping all trains moving anywhere on the lines in and out of Gare Lyon. But the closure procedure has drastic consequences that the signalers could not foresee. It destroys the last chance to avert catastrophe. In order to give the signalers full manual control of the network, it overrides all automatic pre-programming of routes. The points no longer automatically reroute Solan's train into an empty platform. Instead, the points lock into their current position. The collision is now unstoppable. It's the final piece of the puzzle. Investigators can now understand the extraordinary convergence of events that caused the Garde Lyon train crash. How a runaway train was left speeding towards Paris. Why all the safety procedures failed. And how a final twist of fate left hundreds of homeward bound rail passengers seconds from disaster. 33 minutes to disaster. On the Maillant to Paris train, a young woman pulls the emergency cord slamming on the brakes. The emergency cord must be reset to return the brakes to normal before the train can depart. While doing so, Daniel Solan inadvertently closes the air supply to the brakes, rendering them useless and locked on. 20 minutes to disaster. Solan wrongly diagnoses an airlock and bleeds air from the brakes to clear it. Seven minutes to go. The inbound train resumes its fatal journey to Gare de Lyon station. But what no one knows is that it now has just a tiny fraction of its normal braking power. Two minutes to impact. Solan tries the brakes, but gets almost no response. He radios the station, but forgets to identify himself or his train. 90 seconds to disaster. Solan hits the emergency alarm. It prompts signalers to override the automatic routing system that would take the runaway train to an empty platform. It sets the runaway train on a collision course with the packed commuter train on platform two. Disaster is now inevitable. 15 seconds to disaster. Delayed driver Andre Tangi now sees the onrushing train. He orders his passengers to evacuate fast. As the train heads straight for him, he stays at his post, desperately repeating his warning. The collision claims 56 lives. Investigators conclude that had it not been for Tongi's brave self-sacrifice, many more people would have died. The self-effacing Andre Tongi emerges as the hero of the Garde Lyon tragedy. Pascal and the investigation team found that the main cause of the Garde Lyon crash was driver error. But they also highlighted several technical and safety shortcomings in the rail system. They found that the brake pipe lever was too easily accessible and vulnerable to sabotage. The radio system was over complex and drivers needed more training in its use. And they recommended that signalers should be able to turn all signals to red without automatically overriding pre-programmed routes. Odile Miroir, who pulled the emergency cord, Daniel Sola and controller Andre Tolance all faced criminal charges for their role in the accident. Tolance and Miroir were cleared. Daniel Sola served six months of a four-year prison sentence for manslaughter. Survivor Colette Pacalet made a full recovery. However, she remains angry that the buck stopped with Sola, the runaway train driver. 
She believes the train company should also take responsibility. My feeling is that the SNCF is at fault, the SNCF as a whole. It's not one person or two people. It's a whole bunch of things that went wrong that day. Although she had a lucky escape, Dominique Pavi remained haunted by the fact that she survived when so many perished. Then in 2002, she decided to attend a remembrance service at the Gare de Lyon. There she met relatives of the dead for the first time. And then something happened I'll never forget, something very moving. Five or six people stayed behind and moved closer to me and said, Madame, you're the only link with our dead. And that was something I'd never imagined. In the wake of the tragedy, SNCF introduced a raft of new safety measures. An intercom system allowing passengers to talk directly to the driver will replace the emergency cord system. It'll mean that only the driver can activate the brakes in an emergency. It overhauled its driver training program and phased out brake pipe levers. And radio communication on the network was upgraded. Hard lessons were learned from the tragic events at the Gare de Lyon. Modernization came at a high price. But in the wake of the disaster, France now has one of the safest and most technologically advanced rail networks in Europe. <laughs>